This is the sermon for the fourth Sunday in Lent. This morning we are reading John's Gospel, the third chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Today we are considering what is perhaps the most famous of all biblical passages. Growing up in the Lutheran Church, we call the 16th verse of the third chapter of John's Gospel the Gospel in a Nutshell. Paraphrasing Martin Luther, we talked about how if all one had were this one verse, we would still have all we need to find salvation. Well, this morning I'd like to delve into this verse and those that immediately follow. For those of you who regularly follow my teaching, this will probably be just a little refresher on what I sometimes call core convictions. For anyone coming across my teaching for the first time today, particularly if you are coming from a traditional Christian background, some of this may be difficult to digest at first but I would humbly ask you to stick with it and see if there isn't something here that makes at least a little sense. By the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that this sermon relies heavily on the excellent work of Pastor Paul Neuchelein, theologian N.T. Wright, and of course René Girard. Let's begin with the most famous part of this text, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. While this certainly sounds like good news to me, it also tends to breed a kind of converse corollary, one which in all fairness at least seems to be supported by subsequent verses. We can quickly take this verse to mean, okay, if I believe these facts about this Jesus person, then I get this thing called eternal life, presumably what our culture often refers to as heaven. But if I don't believe, then I don't get eternal life. That is, I don't get to heaven. We might then, using this sort of logic, go on to ascertain if John 3.16 is the gospel in a nutshell, so to speak, then the entirety of the gospels must be about how one gets to heaven. The gospels, or maybe the whole New Testament then, could be a sort of how-to-get-to-heaven manual. Let me stop here for a moment. I grew up in a religious environment that focused heavily on the idea of going to heaven when you die. In fact, many talked about that concept as the central reality, the central purpose of the Christian faith. As I went from decidedly serious child to 
decidedly serious teenager, I was a ready candidate for doing the work of an evangelist, at least as my church understood that work. It was, it seemed of paramount importance to share this knowledge that belief in Jesus was the only way to get to heaven, or more importantly, to avoid spending an eternity in hell. Those who oppose my teaching of a completely nonviolent God will, by the way, often use a subsequent verse in our text, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son, as a means of proving their point and supporting the notion that what is being discussed here is an in or out proposition regarding one's eternal destiny. So, as with all of the core conviction sermons, I'm going out on something of a limb. In a way, I can hear my childhood teachers yelling at me, or at least shaking their heads. I can visualize those elders who shook my hand when I was confirmed shaking their heads in complete dismay or even maybe shedding a tear. To begin, verse 14 has Jesus saying, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So this little introduction lets the teacher Nicodemus, whom you will note Jesus is ostensibly addressing, and us, know that what comes next is about saving, about some sort of salvation, that is, being rescued from something. It was a story, by the way, this, this business of Moses lifting up a snake, extremely familiar to Jews. They were, if we look back to uh, Exodus, according to the story, saved from the plague of snakes that was brought on by their own ingratitude. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time this morning uh, parsing out the literal or figurative meaning of those snakes. That's for another discussion. Right now, let's just take this, this little preamble as an analogy. The Son of Man must be lifted up, uh, just like the snake was, so that whosoever believes. And that's the first word, I think, that is a problem for us. Uh, believes. I can already feel those old elders cringing. Belief. Faith. Sola fide, as we like to say. Faith alone. And as I crawl out onto the thinner and thinner branches of my theological limb, I will tell you that the original word here is pisteo, and we have typically translated it as belief or faith. But this is less than accurate, as we now understand in English those words. Pisteo, in fact, implies relational connectivity. Trust might be a better translation, although I think even that doesn't quite sum it up. Profoundly connected to, or better yet, is faithful to, might be a little bit closer. For the sake of simplicity, I have sometimes addressed the issue of faith or belief by suggesting that we examine what it means when we say we believe in someone, some person, as in a real person that we can see and talk to and touch. When a father, for example, says he believes in his son, he is, we hope, not merely saying, I give assent to the fact that you exist. Instead, he is saying, I think, I trust your character, son. Or even, I trust what you will do because I'm so connected to you. I also sometimes like to use the example of someone who believes 
in an ethical principle or philosophical concept. Well, for example, the patriotic American citizen who says, I believe in the Constitution, is, I hope, saying something deeper than, yes, I am intellectually certain this document exists in a guarded glass case somewhere in Washington, D.C. So then maybe we have a little bit more of a sense of what this word, uh, pisteo, really means, what we translate as belief. So we go on. Having this deep connective trust results in eternal life, verse 15 says. It's repeated again in verse 16. And there we stumble across our next major interpretive issue, life eternal. So that's what saving means, right? We get to live forever in something called eternity, presumably some kind of blissful realm outside of ordinary time and space. That understanding has been enhanced because as we have begun to explore first the sky and then space above, we have not found any heavenly realm up there, just sky and space. So we begin to think of eternity as this other timeless dimension that exists, well, forever. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, as the case may be, that is an idea owing far more to Plato than it does to any understanding prevalent in the culture Jesus was addressing. Jews at the time tended to divide human history into two eons. There was the time in which we lived, a time obviously marked by corruption, by decay, by death. This time that we live is full of war, disease, and evil. And then there is another age, an age to come, that age that Jeremiah speaks of when he says, they will all know my law, for it shall be written on their hearts. That age spoken of by Isaiah when he speaks of the mountain of the Lord where the lamb and the lion lay down together and there is no more war. That is the age to come. So that is what the so-called rich young ruler was asking when he said, what must I do to inherit the thing we translate as eternal life. He was not asking, what do I have to do to live forever in heaven? He was asking, how can I get this particular zoe, this particular spiritual life of the eons, the ages, the age to come? So already, even before we have gotten to the ubiquitous 16th verse, I am suggesting that believe is something far deeper than just giving intellectual assent or agreement. And eternal life is something very different than living in heaven after you die. Now on to verse 16. The next verbal stumbling block is perhaps the word world, that thing which God so loves. Cosmos is the word there, and as one might guess, it means in one sense, of course, the universe, all there is, the all in all, so to speak. But literally, the word means the created order, and had come to mean by New Testament times specifically the orderly structures of human society, the dominion of power, so to speak. So then, either way we look at it, this word world, we are either talking about everything there is, has been, and will be, or we are talking specifically about the human structure with all its flaws. In the former understanding, God's love is pervasive throughout all time and space. In the latter, the discussion here 
directs God's love specifically at a profoundly broken, violent, power-grubbing humanity. But either way, as a linguistic metonym, that love extends inclusively and specifically to all people. So we now have, so far, God so loved. And, and by the way, that would be agapeo, the verbal rendering of agape. God so loved the world that he gave his Son that whosoever trusts in or is connected with the character of him will have spiritual life in God's coming age. While I'm climbing out on tiny limbs, uh, let me also interject another sense of order here. Christians often talk about the sacrifice of God's Son to God's righteous wrath. Jesus took our punishment, as it were, uh, that we should not suffer. Yet here, we read of God sending his Son to us. It is trusting in or being connected to him that connects us to the life of the coming age. Nowhere do we read here that God sent his son to what? To himself to be sacrificed. I would here state that God doesn't need blood, not Jesus' blood, nor anyone else's. We, it seems, are the ones who needed blood. We needed God to show us what we were, what we are, the killers of the innocent, the makers of scapegoats, the sacralizers of violence. We needed to see this so that we could stop being those things. I will here state that the Good Friday event is not about a transaction between man and God, nor the devil and God, but rather about deeper understanding of who and what we are, so that we may become all the more capable of connecting to the one who so loves us that he will save us out of the world of power and dominion. Verse 17. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Or thus we read it. But the word there for condemn is in fact krino. And while it might be translated condemn, as it often is, it also means to judge. Uh, judgment, of course, might be negative, that is guilty, or it might be positive, innocent, so to speak. But in fact, a judgment might not be a courtroom kind of thing at all. It might simply be a decision. But either way, the text tells us that Jesus, the Son, was not sent into the world to judge or condemn, if you prefer. Yet we read verse 18 and see that those who do not believe or as I have suggested, do not trust, are not connected to, are already condemned, or judged, as I would prefer to translate. And from this, Christendom supports a theology of eternal condemnation that leads to hell. But we are told in verse 19 what the judgment, in fact, is. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. A judgment, it seems, that has befallen the whole world, at least the human world, the cosmos of human constructs, those people that God loves. Nowhere is sentence pronounced in the way we understand it. Nowhere does it say, you go to hell if you don't believe, or trust, or are connected to. Rather, when you prefer darkness, well, then you indeed live in darkness, at least until you trust the light. 
And who is it that does this judging, this deciding? If it is not Jesus, as we read in verse 17, then it is also not God the Father. For John's Gospel holds that Jesus and the Father are one, one of being and one of mind. So there is then only one other actor, mankind itself. When we prefer darkness, not believing, as it were, in the name of the Son of God, our judgment, or if you insist on the translation, uh, condemnation, is in fact only our own. The verdict is that we remain in the old age, the age where cosmos is still the order of dominion, of power. When we come to trust, to connect, to believe in, in the truest sense, then we are ushered into the Zoe, into the life of the age to come. So now I offer this decidedly less poetic, but I believe more applicable translation of the world's most famous Bible verse. For God so loved those living under the power of dominion that he gave his only Son, that whosoever connects to him in trust will have spiritual life of God's coming age. So what is all of that to us? If this way of looking at the gospel in a nutshell is at all accurate, then Christianity ceases to be a religion about how to get into heaven. It also ceases to be about some sort of celestial transaction, a kind of substitutionary absorbing of punishments. If this way of looking at things is at all correct, the central message of the gospel is not so much Jesus died so you wouldn't have to go to hell. In fact, it's not that at all. But rather, the central message of the gospel becomes even though sinful humanity killed Jesus, Jesus and the Father still forgive, still love. And we, recognizing not only our failings, but also that great and describable love, we may find that new and boundless life, even building the coming age, even creating the kingdom of God here on earth. <laughs>